A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis Chapter 3 It's not true that I'm always thinking of H. Work and conversation make that impossible. But the times when I'm not are perhaps my worst. For then, though I have forgotten the reason, there is spread over everything a vague sense of wrongness, of something amiss, like in those dreams where nothing terrible occurs, nothing that would sound even remarkable if you told it at breakfast time, but the atmosphere, the taste of the whole thing is deadly. So with this, I see the rowan berries reddening and don't know for a moment why they, of all things, should be depressing. I hear a clock strike and some quality it always had before has gone out of the sound. What's wrong with the world to make it so flat, shabby, worn out looking? Then I remember. This is one of the things I'm afraid of. The agonies, the mad midnight moments must, in the course of nature, die away. But what will follow? Just this apathy, this dead flatness? Will there come a time when I no longer ask why the world is like a mean street? Because I shall take the squalor as normal? Does grief finally subside into boredom tinged by faint nausea? Feelings and feelings and feelings. Let me try thinking instead. From the rational point of view, what new factor has H's death introduced into the problem of the universe? What grounds has it given me for doubting all that I believe? I knew already that these things and worse happened daily. I would have said that I had taken them into account. I had been warned, I had warned myself, not to reckon on worldly happiness. We were even promised sufferings. They were part of the program. We were even told, blessed are they that mourn, and I accept it. I've got nothing that I hadn't bargained for. Of course, it is different when the thing happens to oneself, not to others, and in reality not in imagination. Yes, but should it, for a sane man, make quite such a difference as this? No. And it wouldn't for a man whose faith had been real faith, and whose concern for other people's sorrows had been real concern. The case is too plain. If my house has collapsed at one blow, that is because it was a house of cards. The faith which took these things into account was not faith but imagination. The taking them into account was not real sympathy. If I had really cared, as I thought I did, about the sorrows of the world, I should not have been so overwhelmed when my own sorrow came. It has been an imaginary faith playing with innocuous counters labeled illness, pain, death, and loneliness. I thought I trusted the rope until it mattered to me whether it would bear me. Now it matters, and I find I didn't. Bridge players tell me that there must be some money on the game or else people won't take it seriously. Apparently it's like that. Your bid for God or no God, for a good God or a cosmic sadist, for eternal life or non-entity, will not be serious if nothing much is staked on it, and you will never discover how serious it was until the stakes are raised horribly high, until you find that you are playing not for counters or for sixpences, but for every penny you have in the world. Nothing less will shake a man, or at any rate a man like me, out of his merely verbal thinking and his merely notional beliefs. He has has to be knocked silly before he comes to his senses. Only torture will bring out the truth. Only under torture does he discover it himself. And I must surely admit, H would have forced me to admit it in a few passes, that if my house was a house of cards, the sooner it was knocked down, the better. And only suffering could do it. But then the cosmic sadist and eternal vivisector comes an unnecessary hypothesis. Is this last note a sign that I'm incurable? That when reality smashes my dreams to bits, I mope and snarl while the first shock lasts, and then patiently, idiotically start putting it together again? And so always, however often the house of cards falls, shall I set about rebuilding it? Is that what I'm doing now? Indeed, it's likely enough that what I shall call, if it happens, a restoration of faith, will turn out to be only one more house of cards, and I shan't know whether it is or not until the next blow comes. When, say, fatal disease is diagnosed in my body too, or war breaks out, or I have ruined myself by some ghastly mistake in my work, but there are two questions here. In which sense may it be a house of cards, because the things I am believing are only a dream, or because I only dream that I believe them? 
As for the things themselves, why should the thoughts I had a week ago be any more trustworthy than the better thoughts I have now? I am surely in general a saner man than I was then. Why should the desperate imaginings of a man dazed, I said it was like being concussed, be especially reliable? Because there was no wishful thinking in them? Because being so horrible they were therefore all the more likely to be true? But there are fear fulfillment as well as wish fulfillment dreams. And were they wholly dissatisfied? No. In a way, I like them. I am even aware of a slight reluctance to accept the opposite thoughts. All that stuff about the cosmic sadist was not so much the expression of thought as of hatred. I was getting from it the only pleasure a man in anguish can get, the pleasure of hitting back. It was really just Billingsgate, mere abuse, telling God what I thought of him. And of course, as in all abusive language, what I thought didn't mean what I thought true, only what I thought would offend him and his worshippers most. That sort of thing is never said without some pleasure. Gets it off your chest. You feel better for a moment. But the mood is no evidence. Of course, the cat will growl and spit at the operator and bite him if she can, but the real question is whether he is a vet or a vivisector. Her bad language throws no light on it one way or the other. And I can believe he is a vet when I think of my own suffering. It is harder when I think of hers. What is grief compared with physical pain? Whatever fools may say, the body can suffer twenty times more than the mind. The mind has always some power of evasion. At worst, the unbearable thought only comes back and back, but the physical pain can be absolutely continuous. Grief is like a bomber circling round and dropping its bombs. Each time the circle brings it overhead, physical pain is like the steady barrage on a trench in World War I. Hours of it with no let up for a moment. Thought is never static. Pain often is. What sort of a lover am I to think so much about my affliction and so much less about hers? Even the insane call, Come back! is all for my own sake. I never even raised the question whether such a return, if it were possible, would be good for her. I want her back as an ingredient in the restoration of my past. Could I have wished for her anything worse? Having got once through death to come back and then at some later date have all her dying to do over again? They call Stephen the first martyr. Hadn't Lazarus the rawer deal? I begin to see. My love for H was of much the same quality as my faith in God. I won't exaggerate, though. Whether there was anything but imagination in the faith or anything but egoism in the love, God knows. I don't. There may have been a little more, especially in my love for H, but neither was the thing I thought it was. A good deal of the card castle about both. What does it matter how this grief of mine evolves or what I do with it? What does it matter how I remember her or whether I remember her at all? None of these alternatives will either ease or aggravate her past anguish. How do I know that all her anguish is past? I never believed before. I thought it immensely improbable that the faithfulest soul could leap straight into perfection and peace the moment death has rattled in the throat. It would be wishful thinking with a vengeance to take up that belief now. H was a splendid thing, a soul straight, bright, and tempered like a sword, but not a perfect saint. A sinful woman married to a sinful man, two of God's patience, not yet cured. I know there are not only tears to be dried, but stains to be scoured. The sword will be made even brighter. But, oh God, tenderly, tenderly, already month by month and week by week, you broke her body on the wheel whilst she still wore it. Is it not yet enough? The terrible thing is that a perfectly good God is in this matter hardly less formidable than a cosmic sadist. The more we believe that God hurts only to heal, the less we believe that there is any use in begging for tenderness. A cruel man might be bribed, might grow tired of his vile sport, might have a temporary fit of mercy as alcoholics have fits of sobriety, but suppose that what you are up against is a surgeon whose intentions are wholly good. The kinder and more conscientious he is, the more inexorably he will go on cutting. If he yielded to your entreaties, if he stopped before the operation was complete, all the pain up to that point would have been useless. But it is credible that such extremities of torture should be necessary for us. Well, take your choice. The tortures occur. If they are unnecessary, then there is no God or a bad one. If there is a good God, then these tortures are necessary, for no even moderately good being could possibly inflict or permit them if they weren't. Either way, we're for it. 
What do people mean when they say, I am not afraid of God because I know he is good? Have they never even been to a dentist? Yet this is unendurable. And then one babbles, if only I could bear it, or the worst of it, or any of it, instead of her. But one can't tell how serious that bit is, for nothing is staked on it. If it suddenly became a real possibility, then for the first time we should discover how seriously we had meant it. But is it ever allowed? It was allowed to one, we are told, and I find I can now believe again that he has done vicariously whatever can be so done. He replies to our babble, you cannot and you dare not, and I could and dared. Something quite unexpected has happened. It came this morning early. For various reasons, not themselves at all mysterious, my heart was lighter than it had been for many weeks. For one thing, I suppose I am recovering physically from a good deal of mere exhaustion, and I had a very tiring but very healthy twelve hours the day before and a sounder night's sleep. And after ten days of low-hung gray skies and motionless warm dampness, the sun was shining and there was a light breeze, and suddenly at the very moment when, so far, I mourned H. Least, I remembered her best. Indeed, it was something almost better than a memory, an instantaneous, unanswerable impression. To say it was like a meeting would be going too far, yet there was that in it which tempts one to use those words. It was as if the lifting of the sorrow removed a barrier. Why has no one told me these things? How easily I might have misjudged another man in the same situation. I might have said, he's got over it, he's forgotten his wife. When the truth was, he remembers her better because he has partly got over it. Such was the fact, and I believe I can make sense out of it. You can't see anything properly while your eyes are blurred with tears. You can't, in most things, get what you want if you want it too desperately. Anyway, you can't get the best out of it. Now, let's have a real good talk. Reduces everyone to silence. I must get a good sleep tonight. Ushers in hours of wakefulness. Delicious drinks are wasted on a really ravenous thirst. Is it similarly the very intensity of the longing that draws the Iron Curtain that makes us feel we are staring into a vacuum when we think about our dead? Them as asks, at any rate, as asks to importunately, don't get, perhaps can't, and so, perhaps, with God. I have gradually been coming to feel that the door is no longer shut and bolted. Was it my own frantic need that slammed it in my face? The time when there is nothing at all in your soul except a cry for help may be just the time when God can't give it. You are like the drowning man who can't be helped because he clutches and grabs. Perhaps your own reiteration cries deafen you to the voice you hope to hear. On the other hand, knock and it shall be opened. But does knocking mean hammering and kicking the door like a maniac? And there's also to him that hath shall be given. After all, you must have a capacity to receive, or even omnipotence can't give. Perhaps your own passion temporarily destroys the capacity. For all sorts of mistakes are possible when you are dealing with him. Long ago, before we were married, H. was haunted all one morning as she went about her work with the obscure sense of God, so to speak, at her elbow, demanding her attention. And of course, not being a perfected saint, she had the feeling that it would be a question, as it usually is, of some unrepentant sin or tedious duty. At last she gave in. I know how one puts it off, and faced him. But the message was, I want to give you something, and instantly she entered into joy. I think I am beginning to understand why grief feels like suspense. It comes from the frustration of so many impulses that had become habitual. Thought after thought, feeling after feeling, action after action had H for their object. Now their target is gone. I keep on through habit fitting an arrow to the string than I remember and have to lay the bow down. So many roads lead thought to H. I set out on one of them, but now there's an impassable frontier post across it. So many roads once, now so many culs de sac. For a good wife contains so many persons in herself. What was H? Not to me. 
She was my daughter and my mother, my pupil and my teacher, my subject and my sovereign, and always holding all these in solution, my trusty comrade, friend, shipmate, fellow soldier, my mistress, but at the same time all that any man friend, and I have good ones, has ever been to me, perhaps more. If we had never fallen in love, we should have none the less been always together and created a scandal. That's what I meant when I once praised her for her masculine virtues. But she soon put a stop to that by asking how I'd like to be praised for my feminine ones. It was a good repost, dear. Yet there was something of the Amazon, something of Penthesilia and Camilla, and you, as well as I, were glad it should be there. You were glad I should recognize it. Solomon calls his bride sister. Could a woman be a complete wife unless for a moment in one particular mood a man felt almost inclined to call her brother? It was too perfect to last, so I am tempted to say of our marriage. But it can be meant in two ways. It may be grimly pessimistic, as if God no sooner saw two of his creatures happy than he stopped it. None of that here. As if he were like the hostess at the sherry party, who separates two guests the moment they show signs of having got into a real conversation, but it could also mean this had reached its proper perfection. This had become what it had in it to be. Therefore, of course, it would not be prolonged. As if God said, good, you have mastered that exercise. I am very pleased with it. And now you are ready to go on to the next. When you have learned to do quadratics and enjoy doing them, you will not be set them much longer. The teacher moves you on. For we did learn and achieve something. There is hidden or flaunted a sword between the sexes till an entire marriage reconciles them. It is arrogance in us to call frankness, fairness, and chivalry masculine when we see them in a woman. It is arrogance in them to describe a man's sensitiveness or tact or tenderness as feminine. But also what poor warped fragments of humanity most mere men and mere women must be to make the implications of that arrogance plausible. Marriage heals this. Jointly the two become fully human. In the image of God created he them. Thus, by a paradox, this carnival of sexuality leads us out beyond our sexes. And then one or another dies. And we think of this as love cut short, like a dance stopped in mid-career, or a flower with its head unluckily snapped off, something truncated and therefore lacking its due shape. I wonder if, as I can't help suspecting, the dead also feel the pains of separation, and this may be one of their purgatorial sufferings, then for both lovers, and for all pairs of lovers without exception, bereavement is a universal and integral part of our experience of love. It follows marriage as normally as marriage follows courtship or as autumn follows summer. It is not a truncation of the process, but one of its phases, not the interruption of the dance, but the next figure. We are taken out of ourselves by the loved one while she is here. Then comes the tragic figure of the dance in which we must learn to be still taken out of ourselves, though the bodily presence is withdrawn to love the very her, and not fall back to loving our past, or our memory, or our sorrow, or our relief from sorrow, or our own love. Looking back, I see that only a very little time ago I was greatly concerned about my memory of H, and how false it might become. For some reason, the merciful good sense of God is the only one I can think of. I have stopped bothering about that. And the remarkable thing is that since I stopped bothering about it, she seems to meet me everywhere. Meet is far too strong a word. I don't mean anything remotely like an apparition or a voice. I don't mean even any strikingly emotional experience at any particular moment. Rather, a sort of unobtrusive but massive sense that she is, just as much as ever, a fact to be taken into account. To be taken into account is perhaps an unfortunate way of putting it. It sounds as if she were rather a battle axe. How can I put it better? Would momentaneously real or obstinately real do? It is as if the experience said to me, you are, as it happens, extremely glad that H is still a fact. But remember, she would be equally a fact whether you liked it or not. Your preferences have not been considered. How far have I got? Just as far, I think, as a widower of another sort who would stop, leaning on his spade, and say in answer to our inquiry, thank ye, mustn't grumble. I do miss her something dreadful, but they say these things aren't sent to try us. 
we have come to the same point. He with his spade and I, who am not now much good at digging with my own instrument. But of course, one must take scent to try us the right way. God has not been trying an experiment on my faith or love in order to find out their quality. He knew it already. It was I who didn't. In this trial, he makes us occupy the dock, the witness box, and the bench all at once. He always knew that my temple was a house of cards. His only way of making me realize the fact was to knock it down. Getting over it so soon? But the words are ambiguous. To say the patient is getting over it after an operation for appendicitis is one thing. After he's had his leg off is quite another. After that operation, either the wounded stump heals or the man dies. If it heals, the fierce, continuous pain will stop. Presently, he'll get back his strength and be able to stump about on his wooden leg. He has got over it, but he will probably have recurrent pains in the stump all his life, and perhaps pretty bad ones, and he will always be a one-legged man. There will be hardly any moment when he forgets it. Bathing, dressing, sitting down and getting up again, even lying in bed, will all be different. His whole way of life will be changed. All sorts of pleasures and activities that he once took for granted will have to be simply written off. Duties, too. At present I am learning to get about on crutches. Perhaps I shall presently be given a wooden leg, but I shall never be a biped again. Still, there is no denying that in some sense I feel better, and with that comes at once a sort of shame, and a feeling that one is under a sort of obligation to cherish, and foment, and prolong one's unhappiness. I've read about that in books, but I never dreamed I should feel it myself. I am sure H. wouldn't approve of it. She'd tell me not to be a fool." So I'm pretty certain, would God. What is behind it? Partly, no doubt, vanity. We want to prove to ourselves that we are lovers of the grand scale, tragic heroes. Not just ordinary privates in the huge army of the bereaved, slogging along and making the best of a bad job. But that's not the whole of the explanation. I think there is also a confusion. We don't really want grief, in its first agonies, to be prolonged. Nobody could. But we want something else of which grief is a frequent symptom. And then we confuse the symptom with the thing itself. I wrote the other night that bereavement is not the truncation of married love, but one of its regular phases, like the honeymoon. What we want is to live our marriage well and faithfully through that phase too. If it hurts, and it certainly will, we accept the pains as a necessary part of this phase. We don't want to escape them at the price of, of desertion or divorce, killing the dead a second time. We were one flesh. Now that it has been cut in two, we don't want to pretend that it is whole and complete. We will be still married, still in love. Therefore, we shall still ache. But we are not at all, if we understand ourselves, seeking the aches for their own sake. The less of them the better, so long as the marriage is preserved, and the more joy there can be in the marriage between dead and living, the better. The better in every way, for, as I have discovered, passionate grief does not link us with the dead, but cuts us off from them. This become clearer and clearer. It is just at those moments when I feel least sorrow, getting into my morning bath is usually one of them, that H rushes upon my mind in her full reality, her otherness. Not, as in my worst moments, all foreshortened and patheticized and solemnized by my miseries, but she is in her own right. This is good and tonic. I seem to remember, though I couldn't quote one at the moment, all sorts of ballads and folk tales in which the dead tell us that our mourning does them some kind of wrong. They beg us to stop it. There may be far more depth in this than I thought. If so, our grandfather's generation went very far astray. All that sometimes lifelong ritual of sorrow, visiting graves, keeping anniversaries, leaving the empty bedroom, exactly as the departed used to keep it, mentioning the dead either not at all or always in a special voice, or even, like Queen Victoria, having the dead man's clothes put out for dinner every evening. This was like mummification. It made the dead far more dead. Or was that unconsciously, its purpose. Something very primitive may be at work here. To keep the dead thoroughly dead, to make sure that they won't come sliding back among the living, is a main preoccupation of the savage mind. At all costs, make them stay put. 
Certainly these rituals do in fact empathize their deadness. Perhaps this result was not really so unwelcome, not always as the ritualists believed. But I've no business to judge them. All guesswork. I'd better keep my breath to cool my own porridge. For me, at any rate, the program is plain. I will turn to her as often as possible in the gladness. I will even salute her with a laugh. The less I mourn her, the nearer I seem to her. An admirable program. Unfortunately, it can't be carried out. Tonight, all the hells of young grief have opened again. The mad words, the bitter resentment, the fluttering in the stomach, the nightmare unreality, the wallowed in tears, for in grief nothing stays put. One keeps on emerging from a phase, but it always reoccurs. Round and round, everything repeats. Am I going in circles, or do I hope I am on a spiral? But if a spiral, am I going up or down it? How often will it be for always? How often will the vast emptiness astonish me like a complete novelty and make me say, I never realized my loss till this moment. The same leg is cut off time after time. The first plunge of the knife into the flesh is felt again and again. They say the coward dies many times. So does the beloved. Didn't the eagle find a fresh liver to tear in Prometheus every time it dined?